All right, guys, this is it, the last lecture, the last chapter of the book, and the last lecture of the semester. I remember we were skipping chapter 12, um, ran out of time. And uh, so if you could read that summary section, that'd be swell. I feel really bad skipping over it. It's all about food safety and um, preventing foodborne illness. So I'd feel a little better if you could just read those last two pages and um, you know, make yourself aware of food safety. And also, remember, if you do the Connect homework for Chapter 12, it's extra credit. So um, I do encourage you to do that. Otherwise, this is the last lecture, Chapter 13, and it's all about nutrition through the life cycle. So most of the nutrition information when we talk about vitamins, minerals, carbs, proteins, fats, and what the RDAs for, are for those nutrients are, we're talking about in the rest of the book, it's pretty much generalized towards adult nutrition. So the adult phase of the life cycle is the longest phase of your life cycle. It's from the age of about 19 to about 70 is considered adulthood. So, um, but there's other stages of the life cycle. So the life cycle, of course, starts at conception when sperm fertilizes egg. And um, there's this prenatal period where the fetus is still developing in utero inside the mother's womb. So there are specific nutrient needs that pregnant women have in order to fuel the growth of this fetus. Um, when the fetus is born, we call it a baby, and infants have very specialized nutrition requirements, very different than those of adults. Um, and because they're growing so rapidly and because their digestive organs and all of their organ systems are still on the immature side. So their nutrient needs are much, much different than that of an adult. As they grow and become children, they're still their little people, their little adult, their miniature versions of adults. So they still have different nutritional needs and different nutritional concerns than adults have. Um, Children grow into teenagers. Teenagers, teenagehood, adolescence is sort of that last growth spurt before becoming an adult. That's the transition into adulthood. And there's a lot of changes hormonally and physically that the body undergoes that require differences in nutrition. Um, then we have adulthood. And at the end of adulthood, if you're lucky enough, you make it to old age, where in old age, as we get older, our body systems decline and our muscle mass declines. There are physical and physiological changes our bodies go through as we age that affects our nutrient status and our nutrient needs. So um, this chapter really addresses all these other stages of life and nutrition at these other stages of life besides adulthood. So the, your textbook, which I I don't really like that it sort of skips over this part, but technically nutrition during um, pregnancy starts before conception. They sneak this in somewhere in the chapter, but I'm putting it here. So this is very important. About half of pregnancies in the U.S. are unplanned. That means that women get pregnant and don't realize it until usually two or three months in. An unplanned pregnancy you don't all, always recognize until it's already been ongoing for a couple of months. So there's one nutrient that's part, one vitamin that's extremely important during the very early phases of pregnancy. We're talking the first four weeks, the first 28 days of pregnancy, when some of the most basic sort of um, evolution of the embryo occurs. Folate is really important in the early stages of pregnancy. And if you get pregnant and you're not aware of it and you're not taking a folate supplement, you're at risk of folate deficiency and uh, at risk of giving birth to an infant with neural tube defects because during those first 28 days is when the neural tube is starting to form. And if there's not enough folate for it to form properly, then it can form improperly and you get these birth defects that I'll talk about in a few slides. So it's very important for all women who are of childbearing age, so after they've had their period, and are sexually active, um, that they are making sure they're getting enough folate in their diet, either taking a folic acid supplement or eating foods that are high in folate. Um, because folate is very, very important early in pregnancy. Also, if you are planning on conceiving, um, 
you should start taking a folate supplement when you start trying to have a baby. Don't wait until you're pregnant. Um, folic acid, important for even prior to conception. So conception is the same thing as fertilization. It's the moment where sperm meets egg, okay? So here's the female reproductive system here. So the vagina, that's where sperm are ejaculated into here in the vagina, and then they actually swim all the way up here um, to fertilize the egg. And then the fertilized egg moves down the fallopian tubes, implants in the uterus, and starts to grow and develop. The cells start to divide. And the embryo is formed. The embryo is sort of the early stage of development. And as the embryo starts taking form and the placenta and the amniotic sac are formed, then we start referring to it as a fetus. So if you look at pregnancy on a timeline, you start the timeline at conception when sperm meets egg. And the timeline ends, of course, at birth when the newborn is born. So pregnancy, la a normal pregnancy um, is 38 to 42 weeks, so about 40 weeks long. Usually they calculate your due date at 40 weeks, um, but it's sort of a give or take, plus or minus two weeks. And like I said, that first eight weeks or so of the pregnancy is when we refer to the developing fetus as an embryo. Um, and it's during this embryonic stage that folate is really key. So after that eight-week stage when the placenta and the um, amnion have started to form, we start referring to it as a fetus and actually starts looking like a little peanut in the ultrasound, it starts taking, taking shape. Then we start referring to it as a fetus. So as most of you know, um, pregnancy is divided into trimesters, three you know, equal sort of equal length periods. First trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And each of those trimesters are sort of characterized by different stages of development. So the first trimester is very important for um, basically the early stages of development. So all of the organ systems, nervous system, all of the um, uh, sort of fetal, fetal materials like the placenta and the amniotic sac and the umbilical cord are all forming. Everything is kind of taking shape very early on in the first trimester. So the first trimester is really the most fragile of the trimesters. It's, um, you know, sort of it's the start of the ch these chain of events that happen. The cell, first the, you get fertilization and the cells divide and they continue to divide and it's like this chain reaction that amplifies. Um, and everything just kind of starts to mature even more. If something goes haywire or something goes wrong or, you know, you ingest toxins early in the pregnancy, that kind of screws things up and it gets, gets that, that mess up, that error, then gets amplified throughout um, development. So anything that um, the fetus might be sensitive to is it's going to be most sensitive to in the first trimester. So... Um, teratogens, which is a vocabulary word that for some reason is not in this chapter. It was in the chapter on vitamins is when they decided to make it a bold vocabulary word, but I do want you to know it. Uh, a teratogen is any substance that causes birth defects. And the reason it was introduced in the chapter on vitamins is because vitamin A, um, high amounts of vitamin A, not beta carotene, but vitamin A can act as a teratogen. So that's why pregnant women are told to avoid eating large amounts of liver, beef liver, chicken liver, whatever liver has a lot of vitamin A in it, very high amounts of vitamin A. So if you're pregnant, try to limit your liver intake. Um, so teratogens, your, your most, the fetus is most susceptible to teratogens in the first trimester. It's also why most miscarriages occur in the first trimester because if anything goes wrong during that those steps of division, that error just gets amplified and then becomes um, really very problematic. So everything is taking place here. Though. Every, I mean, everything, the organ systems by the end of the first trimester, uh, the fetus are, already has basic organ systems, limb buds, eyes. Everything is sort of there, just very immature. Um, and it just continues to mature from that point. So in the second trimester, it's mostly characterized by lengthening of the fetus, 
hardening of the bones and um, continued maturation of the organ systems. The third trimester is once the baby reaches the third trimester, usually um, if they are born, they, they can survive. Um, so a lot of the critical maturation has been done. Um, and at that point, there's still organs that are maturing. The lungs in particular are sort of the last to reach maturity. So preemie babies tend to have poor lung functioning, um, lung, lung function and need respiratory aids. Uh, but the other major sort of purpose of the third trimester, in addition to finishing organ maturation, is for the fetus to start storing fat and storing iron. These are two things that it will need after it's born. It needs the fat for warmth, insulation, and for energy. And it needs iron for its own iron stores um, because breast milk is actually fairly low in iron and that's usually the source of nutrition for newborns. So they actually steal iron from the mom during the third trimester and store it in their own bodies, enough stores to last them about six months. Um, okay, so the health of a newborn is largely determined by body weight of the newborn. Low birth weight babies are defined as babies that are less than five and a half pounds when they're born. And there's a lot of um, risks or, or th things, to, things that can, can like be afflictions of babies that have low birth weight. So if they're low birth weight, they don't have enough fat stores. Um, they probably don't have as much organ maturation. So uh, they have a increased risk for infections, oftentimes learning disabilities, uh, and they have a higher risk of mortality in the first year of life. Preemie babies are also, um, so you can have a, a term baby that has a low birth weight, so they've gone all the way to 37, 38 weeks, but they're just very small when they're born, which can also be some sign of, you know, improper nourishment within the womb, like the placenta wasn't functioning properly. Um, preterm babies are babies that are born small because they're born early. That is before 37 weeks. And they often have similar complications. Um, very preterm babies are those defined as being born between 26 weeks and 32 weeks. I guess babies can be born before 26 weeks, but the likelihood of their survival is extremely low. Um, at 26 weeks, there is chance that they will survive with a lot of intensive care. Um, but low birth weight and preemie babies definitely have increased risk of death in the first year. They have a lot more health complications. So people who are at risk for low birth weight babies that are term babies are moms that are either older or very young, so bef older than 45 or younger than 15, and also smokers. Smokers, Smoking increases your risk for low birth weight babies. Um, genetics can have, it, have an effect too. If, you're, if you were a low birth weight baby, your mom carried low birth weight babies, um, you are at higher risk as well. So now that we know a little bit about the biology of and the terminology around birth and pregnancy, let's talk about the nutritional needs of the mother during pregnancy. So here's a picture of a pregnant mother. <laughs> Me, hi. Um, and a little, some of the general things that occur, changes in a woman's body when she becomes pregnant. That all the changes that occur are for the purpose of preparing the body to grow a fetus and eventually to produce milk to nourish that fetus once it is born. So one of the first things that happens is you get increased blood volume. Um, your blood volume has to uh, increase by about 50% in order to increase blood flow to the placenta and to the, and to the newborn, or the, sorry, to the fetus. Um, and so that happens, starts happening actually in the first trimester. You also get increase in breast size. Again, in preparation for, excuse me, for milk production. Um, and all of these changes, a lot of these changes 
and other changes are fueled by the various pregnancy hormones that are produced, um, which cause a number of different side effects, as including mood changes and um, other change, other things that we'll talk about, like cravings, for example. So there's a lot, and morning sickness. So there's a lot of a little more detail of some of the signs and changes that a woman's body undergoes during pregnancy. Um, a lot of women claim they know, they, they realize they were pregnant. Um, the first sign that they had that they were pregnant was tenderness in their breasts. You start having breast changes right away um, as soon as you get pregnant from progesterone, the pregnancy hormone. Um, it helps to increase your breast size and help proliferate the milk ducts in order to prepare for milk production. After late after birth, um, the pregnant the not pregnancy hormone after birth another hormone is secreted called prolactin, which promotes actual milk production um, from the breasts. Morning sickness another sign, common early sign of pregnancy. It's just basically nausea uh, that's thought to be caused by the excessive hormone production during pregnancy. Not every woman experiences it. I was lucky enough not to have any morning sickness. Some women just feel sort of a nauseous lack of appetite. Others are actively vomiting. So if you are vomiting a lot, that can be cause for concern. It can cause dehydration or malnutrition. Or if you're not eating because of the nausea, it can cause nutrient deficiency. So morning sickness can be a serious nutrition issue during pregnancy. Um... There's different ways, different people have different ways of managing morning sickness, eating, um, snacking instead of eating meals. Um, some women report they get morning, they get nauseous if they haven't eaten in a while, so making sure you always have a snack on hand. Certain foods might trigger it. Um, exercise often helps morning sickness, so there's different ways. Some pe it, people should be cautious about taking medication, though, for morning sickness. Um, but there are some that doctors can prescribe. Fatigue is another common early symptom of, or sign of pregnancy. It is um, caused by the increase in blood volume. So as your blood cells are trying to reproduce, it's like, think about if you um, donate blood, you often feel sort of fatigued, like, an, like anemia. Um, fatigue during early pregnancy is very common due to your body working hard to increase your blood volume and in those early stages of blood volume increase what what happens first is your body starts retaining more fluids and electrolytes and increases sort of the water component of your blood and then as it's doing that it starts producing more red blood cells but the red blood cells don't really catch up yet so there is a sort sort of period of of anemia early in pregnancy as your blood volume is increasing. So it does lead to a lot of fatigue early on. Other common issues during pregnancy, edema, which is the medical word for swelling. This is not swelling like when you get a mosquito bite and it's red and itchy and infl inflammatory. Edema is a non-inflammatory type of swelling. It's just fluid retention. Um, so it's water in your stored in your fluids that causes swelling. Um, it's common in pregnant women; their hands and feet start to swell. They can't wear their wedding ring anymore, or their shoes don't fit. Um, they get cankles. Okay, so that's one pretty common sign in pregnancy: this extra fluid retention. Also common in pregnancy are different digestive issues, namely constipation and heartburn a lot of times due to pregnancy hormones, particularly one hormone called relaxin. Relaxin, the purpose of relaxin is to help relax the uterus muscle so it can, the muscles of the uterus and the ligaments surrounding the uterus so that they can stretch as the baby grows. Um, but it, <laughs> relaxin happens to work on lots of different muscles. It's not specific to the uterus. So you get relaxation of a lot of muscles, including those in the bowels. So it slows down bowel movements and peristalsis, which can lead to constipation. So if you are constipated ever, whether pregnant or not, the key to helping um, bowel movements is fiber and fluids. Those things both help 
uh, with constipation. So, especially if you're pregnant. Sorry. You're not getting a lot of sleep these days. Um, the other common issue in pregnancy is heartburn. I experienced heartburn for the first time when I was pregnant. I never had it before, and I was like, what is this sensation? Because I always thought it's called heartburn. I imagined that it felt like a burning in your chest. But for me and for a lot of people, it actually feels more like a burning in your in the in the throat, like in the back of my throat. So um, it confused me at first, and it's not pleasant, and I'm glad it's gone now. Um, but it can be due for basically two reasons. So early on in pregnancy, if you start experiencing heartburn, it's again from that hormone relaxin, actually relaxing that sphincter, that lower esophageal sphincter that holds the um, stomach close to the esophagus, that, hor that relaxant hormone can loosen that sphincter so that gastric juice starts leaking up into the esophagus. Um, the other reason is, I guess, sort of illustrated here. As the, as the fetus grows and the uterus grows, it starts pushing up and pushing out of the way your bowels and other organs in your abdominal space until your stomach is so squished up into your rib cage that it's really like the fetus is actually sort of compressing your stomach and that can squeeze gastric juice up into the esophagus. So um, those are the two sort of causes of heartburn during pregnancy. How to treat it, there's different ways. So a lot of um, advice is to eat smaller meals because um, you want your stomach to be less full if it's less full, then it's less likely to overflow up into the esophagus. Uh, also, don't lie down soon after eating. Take a couple hours after eating before lying down. So that means don't eat dinner late and then go to bed early. Um, because then your stomach is still full of food. And when you lie down, you know, gravity's not... When you're standing up, gravity's sort of keeping that food in your stomach. But when you lie down, it's more likely to leak out up into your esophagus. And then finally, antacids. Antacids, most antacids are perfectly safe during pregnancy and also fairly effective. So um, that's another option to help control that heartburn. So um, when it comes to eating for two, you're not really eating for two in terms of calories or really in any of the nutrients. Your nutrient needs do not double because you have another um organism growing inside you. All right, a fetus is much smaller, needs much less energy than you, your whole body, than an adult woman does. So the extra caloric needs of a pregnant woman are actually fairly small. So you don't need to eat double if you are pregnant. Um, and that's, that's actually a recipe for gaining too much weight. And we'll talk about appropriate weight gain during pregnancy in a moment. And some people don't realize this, but in the first trimester, the first trimester, the growth that's going on is very small. You know, you start with one cell, it doubles to two, four, eight, sixteen, so on and so forth. So the embryo is very small. The fetus at the end of the first trimester is still very, very small. Um, so not a whole lot of energy necessarily needed to go into um, into that. You do have a lot of higher micronutrient needs, but um, your macronutrient needs really don't change in the first trimester. Um, in the second trimester, the fetus is growing considerably, lengthening, the bones are hardening, so you do need to fuel a little more. You need energy to fuel that more. So um, about an extra 300 calories a day, 340 calories a day during the second trimester. In the third trimester, the baby starts storing fat, remember? So that you definitely need extra energy for. So in the third trimester, you need about 450 extra calories a day. Okay, so that's not much. That's like one meal, one extra meal a day. Um, one small, healthy meal. So no change in calorie needs during the first trimester. During the second and third trimesters, an extra three or four hundred calories to help fuel the growth of the fetus. Um, you can average that out and say, you know, during pregnancy, eat an extra three hundred calories a day throughout the whole thing, or you could increase your calorie caloric intakes as you go along. Um, either way, but the point is, 
you don't need to eat double, okay? You definitely don't need to eat double when you are pregnant. Um, other nutrients that are really important during pregnancy, folate, already mentioned that, that it's important before pregnancy, but it is really important throughout. Um, but particularly in that first trimester, your needs for folate go up 50%. And um, if you don't get enough folate, you can suffer, the fetus can suffer from neurological neural tube defects. And the two most common neural tube defects are spina bifida, which is a hernia of the spinal cord um, that has to be surgically fixed and often leaves um, disability. So either paralysis or reduced functioning of the lower half of the body. Um, sometimes it can lead to brain issues, brain functioning issues. Uh, another neural tube defect is anencephaly. Anencephaly is really a fatal condition. Usually the baby, babies who have anencephaly are born stillborn or they die very shortly after birth because they're literally missing parts of their brain and skull. The brain and skull do not form properly because the neural tube didn't develop properly and um, the babies don't survive that. So folate needs for a non-pregnant person, non-pregnant woman, 400 micrograms per day. The recommendation, um, as put forth by the USDA and the American Dietetic Association, for pregnant women is 600 micrograms per day. Oftentimes, um, your doctor, your OBGYN, will recommend or put you on a supplement that's 800 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams per day. You know, it might be overkill, but um, that's what the American Gynecological and Obstetrical Association recommends. Um, something else to mention that your book, I don't think your book mentions, but is kind of important, is that I think maybe it mentioned it er earlier in the book. That's why I don't like this book. I don't feel like anything's mentioned in the right places. But when you are pregnant, when a woman is pregnant, all of those hormones and things that, one of the reasons, another reason that you have um, constipation during pregnancy is that uh, the hormones, the pregnancy hormones, sorry, I'm trying to get back to this slide. The pregnancy hormones slow down um, digestion and absorption in order to maximize absorption. So you actually, a lot of the micronutrients are more bioavailable during pregnancy. You actually absorb more nutrients during pregnancy. Your body slows down digestion in order to be able to absorb more nutrients from food because you need more nutrients from food. But I guess you don't want to count on your body absorbing extra from the food. You want to make sure that you're getting that little bit of extra in your diet. Um, so I, that's kind of interesting that your body actually absorbs more nutrients when you're pregnant. Another important nutrient when you're pregnant, another important micronutrient is iron. Iron, remember, is a mineral that's really important for transporting oxygen through the blood. And if you don't get enough iron, you can have iron deficiency anemia. Now, um, you're, remember, when you're pregnant, your blood volume increases. You're making more red blood cells. Therefore, you need more iron to make those red blood cells. Uh, so iron needs go up. Granted, remember, iron is, is the only mineral that your body doesn't have a way of excreting. Your body stores iron. Um, once it absorbs it, it's stuck in your body forever, and if your red blood cells die, then that iron from them gets stored in the liver until you need it to make more red blood cells. Um, so the, really the only way the body loses iron is through bleeding, and women usually lose a lot of iron every month when they menstruate. So when you're pregnant, you stop menstruating. It's one of the ways that, I mean, you stop menstruating because the uterine lining is now being used to you know, grow a baby, but also it helps preserve your iron stores. Um, so the iron that you absorb, you keep and can use to build up your blood stores. So another reason you, that iron is very important during pregnancy is, remember during the third trimester, the fetus actually starts stealing iron from the mother to store in its own body to give it iron when it's born, to provide enough iron for a couple of months as the infant grows and grows blood cells, etc. So iron is an important nutrient for mothers. Iron deficiency during pregnancy can be very dangerous. The risks for the fetus are low birth weight or preterm um, birth. 
if there's not enough iron, um, or even death if the deficiency is that severe. The risk to the mother, usually during if she has iron deficiency anemia during pregnancy, she'll just feel extra tired, very fatigued, the normal sort of signs and symptoms of anemia. But what's really dangerous is if she is anemic when she goes into labor because you often lose a lot of blood during labor, during the birthing process. And if you are already anemic, your body can't afford to lose very much blood. So women who have um, iron deficiency, pregnant women with iron deficiency, are at a much higher risk of, of hemorrhaging to death after um, giving birth. So making sure that your iron status is up to par is very important. So those are the two nutrients that the chapter really focuses on. There's a table, the table that I stole this figure from, goes through some other nutrients that are increased, that are important as well during pregnancy. Calcium and vitamin D in order for the developing fetus's bones to form properly and to start mineralizing and hardening a little bit, particularly during the second and third trimester. Um, Zinc is important, very similar to folate in terms of DNA um, and cell division. Sodium is an important nutrient. You don't your needs for sodium don't change, but sodium can affect your blood pressure levels. And we'll talk about coming up how high blood pressure can be particularly dangerous during pregnancy. So limiting your sodium and increasing your potassium can help you to regulate your blood pressure. Um, there's a few others as well that are mentioned. So some, I guess, topical issues concerning pregnancy that have to do with nutrition are fish and food cravings. So fish is sort of a controversial food item for pregnant women. Fish are jam-packed with healthy fats, with omega-3 fatty acids, which are really good for develop for fetal development. They help with eye and nervous tissue development of the fetus. So it's really important to actually include fish in your diet if you're pregnant. Um, but something to be aware of is that certain fish are very high, have very high concentrations of methylmercury, which can be teratogenic, can be very bad and cause birth defects. So pregnant women want to stay away from fish that are high in mercury, and there's lists of them. Swordfish is near the top of the list, so I have a picture there of swordfish. Don't eat swordfish when you're pregnant. Um, but most of the fish that are sort of more common, that are commonly available in restaurants and grocery stores, tuna, salmon, tilapia, cod, pollock, all of those, haddock, they're all um, very safe in terms of mercury levels. Tuna is kind of um, on the fence. They have sort of low or moderate amounts, so there's restrictions on how much tuna you should have. You know, like one or two servings a week of the canned type. Um, I forget for like steak tuna what's considered um, okay. But so tuna you might want to limit because it does have, contain some mercury, but it also contains omega-3s. So it's all about balance. It's all about moderation, right? Food cravings are something that pregnant women commonly um, experience. Okay, the pickles and ice cream is the sort of canonical food craving. I didn't. Cra I don't know anyone who's who ate pickles and ice cream, but um, the cravings that people have are very variable. Um, sometimes some women have very specific cravings. They want something. I know at one point in my pregnancy, my cravings kind of changed. I didn't really have any that, that lasted like for the duration of the pregnancy. But um, early on, there was like a couple of weeks where I was really craving salmon. I really wanted salmon. And I finally made myself some. Um, and then later in the pregnancy, I was craving sodas and iced tea, sweet tea. So something like sweet to drink. So the salmon was kind of a more specific craving. It was like a specific food, and I wanted it cooked a specific way. My aunt makes the salmon. It's like baked with like the sauce is soy sauce and brown sugar mixed together, and it's kind of like crispy when it when she's done making it. I don't even know. I think she like pan fries it or something. I tried making it. It came out okay, but it's really good. Soy sauce and brown sugar. Um, 
on salmon. It's delish. So that was a very specific craving that I had. But then later in the pregnancy, it was more general. I just wanted something sweet to drink. And so any kind of juice or soda or sweet tea usually sufficed. Um, so some people sometimes will crave something salty or something sweet. And it's not necessarily something specific. One food craving to type of food craving to watch out for is cravings for non-food items. This is a disease or a condition called pica. I think it's considered like a psychological condition actually. But pica occurs a lot in children as well, something you want to watch out for in kids, but also in pregnant women, particularly can be dangerous for pregnant women. Um, it's cravings for non-food items. And I've had students in the past who knew people or who had experienced levels of pica. I had one student who she said she didn't eat soap, but she like really craved, she wanted to lick it all the time. So it's a certain type, like Irish spring soap or something. She just really liked to lick it and just like taste it. And that's all she needed. She didn't eat it. And so her doctor said, that's okay as long as you're not eating it, you know, but it has to do with the weird stuff that hormones, that pregnancy hormones do to our bodies and, and do to our cravings. So if you know someone who is pregnant and they are craving eating non-food items like dirt or soap or even things like flour, which is technically a food item, but it's not meant to be eaten as just flour. Flour can't be digested properly and can actually glob up like clay in your intestines and form a blockage. Um, another one, my old textbook had this feature on a woman who had pica and she craved ice. She always wanted to eat ice, which ice is not bad for you. It's water, right? So in a way, it's good. But the problem was she was eating ice instead of eating food, and then she wasn't getting nourished properly. So um, even something that seems harmless, like wanting to craving ice all the time, um, can be detrimental if you're not then eating properly. So pica is kind of weird, but kind of cool and, and kind of a real thing. So um, got to watch out for it. So when you are pregnant, it is normal to gain weight. You need to gain weight. You're growing another human inside of you, so that's going to cause you to gain weight. Um, how much weight you should gain is dependent on how much you weighed before you were pregnant, so your pre-pregnancy weight. So if you are in a normal, healthy BMI range, um, between 18 and a half and 25 on the BMI scale, you should expect to gain about 25 to 35 pounds, and that's considered healthy, normal weight gain. Um, if you are an underweight, if you are already, if you are underweight before you're pregnant, you actually need to gain a little bit more than that because you need to kind of get your body up to a healthy weight, and then also gain that 25 to 35 pounds on top. So underweight women need to gain a few more pounds than normal weight women. Likewise, overweight women don't need to gain as much. They already have a lot of energy and fat stores that they can utilize for fetal development. They don't need to gain as much, put on as much weight, maybe 15 to 20 pounds. Um, pregnant teenagers also are in a class where they need to gain extra weight because pregnant teenagers, their bodies are still changing. They're still undergoing puberty. Um, and their growth spurt and bone development. So making sure that they get energy to fuel their own development and growth in addition to the development and growth of their fetus is important. And then also shorter women should gain less. They don't need to gain quite as much. What are the consequences of gaining too much or too little weight during pregnancy? Well, if you don't gain enough weight, you're at risk of having a low birth weight baby less than five and a half pounds, and we already talked about the health repercussions of low birth weight babies. If you eat, if you, if you eat, if you gain too much weight during pregnancy, um, you're at risk for having a large birth weight baby, a high birth weight baby, I should say. And high birth weight babies are not unhealthy in and of, like, in and of themselves, but A, if they're very large, it's very hard for them to come out during labor. So it's an increased risk of some kind of trauma during vaginal delivery or increased risk for C-section. Um, also, there can be repercussions for the baby long after birth. A high birth weight babies are 
at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. They're at higher risk of becoming developing into obese children and adults. So um, it's really actually very important. Your nourishment during pregnancy can determine a lot of the genetics and the biology of the fetus of your baby. Um, so decisions you make when you're pregnant really can affect the life of your child for the long term. Pregnancy is not a time to decide to go on a diet. If you are overweight and you become pregnant, it's not the time to say, oh, I should lose some weight and become healthier for this pregnancy. No, you don't want to start a diet during pregnancy. You want to make sure that you're getting all of the nutrients that you need. Um, you want to practice moderation. You know, you don't you don't want to overeat ever, even during pregnancy. Remember, you only need an extra three to four hundred calories when you're pregnant. Not that much, but still, dieting is is not the time to start some kind of restrictive diet because then you could risk becoming nutrient deficient. So all this extra weight, 25 to 35 pounds, that sounds like a lot. You know, newborn is maybe 8 pounds, you know, give or take a few pounds. So where does all that other weight come in? Um, I like this little pie graph from my other book that shows you. So the fetus is not just the fetus. The fetal tissue also includes the amniotic sac and the amniotic fluid in it, as well as the placenta. So all of these tissues, the newborn the placenta and the amniotic fluid account for about 10 to 12 pounds, which is about a third of the weight that you put on, maybe a half to a third of the weight that you would put on um, in that healthy range. So you lose that very quickly. I mean, you lose all of that immediately after giving birth, but a lot of times there's still fluid retention and swelling, so you might not see your weight on the scale go down that much um, in the first couple of days, but you... It definitely in a couple couple of days or a couple of weeks after birth, that's definitely gone. Also, what goes away pretty quickly are these extra maternal blood stores. So remember, your blood increases in volume. Um, that volume actually has a significant mass, so three to eight pounds. It's like water weight almost. And you lose a lot of that also after childbirth. You start shedding extra water. Um, that's been stored to increase your blood volume. The uterus, when you're pregnant, actually has to thicken and stretch and become larger. So you actually gain a little bit of mass there on the uterus. Your breast tissue, breast size increases in preparation for milk production. So that's an extra three pounds, and that doesn't even necessarily account for milk production, which weighs even more. Um, and then lastly, about a third, a quarter, or a third of the weight gain goes to maternal fat stores. So fat stores that help to fuel um, the growth of the fetus. So when it comes to weight gain during pregnancy, the rate of weight gain is looks something like this. So remember in the first trimester, you don't have extra calorie needs. The fetus, or the embryo, is very, very small and it does develop into a fetus in the first trimester, but it's still very, very small. So there really shouldn't be much weight gain during the first trimester. So the first 13 or 14 weeks, you're expected to gain about 5 pounds. Another thing is that during the first um, trimester, a lot of women experience a lot of morning sickness, so it's not actually uncommon to lose a couple of pounds during the first trimester. But usually you kind of stay fairly constant, maybe gain a few pounds by the end of the first trimester. Then notice that the rate of weight gain increases steeply. And by the end of the third trimester of pregnancy, you should be gaining about a pound a week. One pound per week is sort of the general rule. Um, so that by the end of pregnancy, you're in that 25 to 35 uh, pounds of gain. So there's a few different types of complications that are nutrition related that can occur during pregnancy. One is gestational diabetes. So remember, diabetes is any time you have is it a disease where there's issues controlling blood sugar levels. Um, that blood sugar levels become too high for one of two reasons, either A, there's not enough insulin production, and that's usually, we're talking about type 1 diabetes. 
The other reason um, for improper or extra high blood glucose is having insulin resistance or losing insulin sensitivity. So the body produces insulin, but the cells are not responding to it. They're not opening up and letting glucose in from the blood, so that's why there's very high glucose levels in the blood. Gestational diabetes is a temporary condition, and it can be caused by either of those causes. Either your body stops producing insulin in response to all these crazy hormones, or your cells stop responding to insulin during pregnancy. Um, and there's no real rhyme or reason why women develop gestational diabetes. It's usually women who do not have diabetes um, who just develop this spontaneously, just gestational diabetes. Luckily, it usually resolves itself after birth. So after you give birth, the, the diabetes goes away and you're able to regulate your blood sugar normally and you don't have to check it regularly or be on any special diets. Um, other issues with gestational diabetes that increases your risk for develop, delivering a large baby, a, large, a high birth weight baby, which like we said can be traumatic at birth, also increases the, the infant's risk for, um, for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. Uh, lastly, having high blood glucose levels or uncontrolled blood glucose levels can lead to further complications, including um, pregnancy-induced hypertension, so also known as PIH, also known as preeclampsia or toxemia is what you might have heard a doctor refer to it as. Essentially, it's just high blood pressure during pregnancy. Um, that's the main characteristic of it. Other characteristics of pregnancy-induced hypertension are swelling or edema in the hands and feet and sometimes face. Um, and also the presence of protein in the urine. So if you're pregnant and you have to go in to your doctor for monthly um, prenatal visits, they're always going to make you pee in a cup because they always want to check your urine for protein to see. And they'll also, also take your blood pressure. They're checking for pregnancy-induced hypertension, which affects about 8% of pregnant women. Uh, First-time moms are at a higher risk. And... Um, if you don't treat it, if you um, don't treat this hypertension or preeclampsia, it can progress to a very serious condition called eclampsia, which is just a fancy word for convulsions or seizures during pregnancy, and those can be fatal. So making sure you control um, PIH or preeclampsia is important to prevent this, to prevent... Uh, progression to eclampsia. So most treatments focus on controlling blood pressure. Um, and what are some different ways nutritionally or that we've talked about in this class that you can use to control blood pressure? I'll give you a second. And a hint. Water. Water. Hydrating can actually help you to control your blood pressure. Why? Because it helps you to flush out any excess sodium. And sodium, remember, can contribute to high blood pressure. And decreasing sodium in the diet and or increasing potassium can often help you lower your blood sugar, I mean your blood, blood uh, pressure. So, um, good idea for pregnant women to try to limit sodium in general. Make sure they're drinking plenty of fluids and try to eat a lot of fresh foods that contain a lot of potassium. Um, those are good nutritional ways to control your blood pressure. Another way to help control your blood pressure is exercise. Exercise can actually really help, um, help you control your blood pressure both during pregnancy and not during pregnancy. Um, the use of drugs during pregnancy is very controversial. So drugs can pass into the placenta and pass into the fetus, and the fetus does not have a mature liver. It doesn't have mature organ systems that can filter out these drugs. And so the drugs kind of just hang out and, and wreak havoc and cause damage um, in the fetus. So some drugs that are a big no-no, alcohol. Alcohol consumption is the... All of the sort of governing bodies, USDA, American Pediatric Association, American Dietetic Association, 
all advise you not to drink any alcohol during pregnancy. There is no known safe amount of alcohol to consume. Um, so they basically just say don't drink it at all. Don't even get near it. Don't even smell it. Is that a bit extreme? Maybe, yes. But definitely want to limit your alcohol intake to as minimal as possible during pregnancy because alcohol can pass out through the fetus and cause developmental delays, developmental difficulties in the fetus. Another, um, another drug, I guess, to avoid during pregnancy is smoking. Nicotine passes into, through the placenta and into the fetal blood and, um, is not good stuff. So avoid smoking, avoid drinking, and I have here just say no to drugs. Illegal drugs can also cause all kinds of damage to a developing fetus, so just say no. Um, and then one thing that your book doesn't cover but I think is appropriate too is caffeine. Caffeine is a drug. Um, it's a substance and it can be potentially harmful in large amounts. So the recommendation right now is no more than 200 milligrams a day when pregnant. That's about the equivalent of two cups of caffeinated coffee, of strong caffeinated coffee um, during pregnancy or like one, like a like one of the like really large Starbucks coffees. Um, uh, excess caffeine consumption is correlated with low birth weight, preterm, and I think miscarriage. So you just want to moderate. Moderate is key here. Uh, moderate amounts of caffeine are okay. Excessive amounts of caffeine, not okay. Um, and one of the last things in regards to nutrition and physical activity in pregnancy is physical activity. Exercise is very important and very beneficial in pregnancy. It keeps you physically fit, keeps you feeling good, which helps you feel better um, with your developing abdomen. Uh, pre uh, physical activity is a great mood booster. It releases endorphins, which are neurotransmitters that or like hormones that make you feel good, literally make you feel good. So exercise can be an excellent mood booster. Um, a lot of times, you know, during pregnancy, your appetite is increased, you're eating more, you're eating for two, and exercise can help you to burn off any extra excess calories that you're eating, um, particularly in that first trimester when your energy needs are not any higher. Um, it helps regulate your blood pressure. We talked about that. And also it helps, it helps you to keep from gaining too much weight during pregnancy, but it also helps you to lose the weight after pregnancy. So I have here some good types of exercise for pregnant women. Yoga or Pilates balls, um, walking, swimming. These are all low-impact activities that increase calorie burning, increase fitness without being too exhausting or too taxing on the body. When it comes to exercise and pregnancy, Things you want to avoid, the, the sports that you should avoid really are anything that is strenuous enough that you could overheat. So like running in the hot weather could be dangerous. Um, and also anything where you could fall and injure yourself or fall on your stomach. So um, anything with balls that f come flying at you that could hurt you. Um, riding a bike or riding a horse where you could fall off. Those are the types of exercises that are not recommended, more because of your potential for injuring yourself and therefore the fetus than the exercise actually being bad for your body in some way. So that is nutrition during pregnancy. After pregnancy, you're left with this newborn infant, uh, like I have downstairs, and these infants have very particular nutrient needs and it's because they have very interesting life the first year of life is is a very interesting time in terms of growth of an infant so it's the only period of life where we grow that rapidly in one year a newborn infant triples their birth weight and increases their length by 50 percent in one year one year that's huge tripling their weight so, um, a lot of special nutrient needs for infants.
next. When it comes to feeding infants, the slogan of the USDA and the American Pedia Association of Pediatricians is this, breast is best. Breast milk is the best source of nourishment for newborns, for growing infants. It's nature's perfect meal that's been custom designed to meet the nutrient needs of a developing infant. And breast milk is sort of magical in that it evolves over time. It evolves over the course of, you know, a year of feeding a baby, but it also evolves over the few minutes of a feeding session. It's very cool. So the first milk that's produced is called colostrum. It's the milk that's produced the first couple of days after the infant is born. And um, it's very thick and yellowy, and it has some you know, special qualities to it. For one, it's very rich in antibodies and other immune factors. Sorry. <sighs> um, a newborn infant does not have much of an immune system. So breast milk is a very, uh, is really the only way um, that infants can have some immunity to things. So the mother can actually pass antibodies and other immune cells to the infant through breast milk, which helps protect the infant from infections, etc. Colostrum also helps promote healthy bacteria colonization of the intestines of the infant. So Infants are born with sterile intestines. Inside your developing, you know, womb, there is no bacteria. So a fetus does not have all that normal bacteria in the intestinal tract until after they're born. So one way they can get colonized is actually as they're coming through the birth canal, coming through the vagina, they actually swallow or inhale some of the, you know, bacteria in that environment, and they can colonize that way. But the other way is through breast milk. So um, breast milk does help to uh, uh, promote growth of those intestinal bacteria. Lastly, colostrum, that initial milk, has a laxative effect, which helps the baby pass their first stools, helps their bowel movements get started, which is important um, for, you know, for newborn health. So after the first couple of days, the colostrum changes into mature milk. Mature milk, um, like I said, is it actually evolves over the course of a feeding. So here I have a picture of colostrum in a test tube and mature milk, the foremilk and the hind milk. So during a feeding session, the first milk that comes out, the foremilk, is more watery. It has a watery consistency. It's full of carbs and fluids. And the thinking is that it's, it's to quench the thirst of the baby when they first start suckling. They're hungry, they come for nourishment, and they immediately get their thirst quenched by this four milk. As the feeding continues for a few minutes, the consistency of the milk changes, and there's actually um, more fat that comes out in the milk later in the feeding. So this hind milk is thicker and fattier. It's like skim milk versus whole milk or something. And it's thought that this hind milk helps to make the baby feel full and satiated so they want to be done eating. But that hind milk has a lot of, it's a rich source of omega-3 and omega-6 fats that are important for um, infant development. So it's kind of neat that breast milk does that, that it actually changes over the course of the feeding. So there's a lot of benefits to breastfeeding, both for the infants and for the mothers. For the infants, we already mentioned added immunity from antibodies is very important. Um, and the helping the healthy bacteria colonize. It's also, breast milk is also very easy, easily digestible. Nature has designed it to be um, containing a lot of simple sugars, simple proteins, things that do not need a lot of um, breakdown because, or a lot of digestion because the infant's digestive tract is still immature, it's still developing. And so, um, having things that are easily digestible doesn't tax the infant's digestive system. Um, it increases the, the, it decreases the risk of infections because of those antibodies and other immune factors. And it can do that cool thing where it changes in composition um, in order to, to meet the changing needs of the infant. 
So some of the advantages of breastfeeding for the mother, it promotes bonding, it's cheap, and it's convenient. So formula is actually very expensive. Um, breast, or feeding formula feeding a baby could, adds quite an expense to to the child care list. Breastfeeding, however, is free. You just nourish yourself and the milk comes. Um, it's also a lot easier. If the baby gets hungry, you don't have to go warm up a bottle. You just pull out your breast and food's there. It's ready to go. Um, so that's nice for the mother. Other things, it can decrease the breast, breastfeeding can decrease your risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. It also is important right after delivery in helping to staunch the bleeding in your uterus. So after you give birth, you immediately um, can bring the baby up to your breast to suckle and start breastfeeding. And that suckling will trigger, actually trigger contractions of the uterus that help it to stop bleeding and that help it to start shrinking um, back to its normal size. Next. So how does milk production work? Well, this, this figure from your book is very informative. Um, lactation is the technical term for milk production. And there's sort of four steps here. Okay, so the first step is the baby starts suckling. That suckling actually triggers um, the pituitary gland in the brain to produce a couple of hormones, that those being um, oxytocin and prolactin. Um, oxytocin helps to stimulate what's called the letdown, all right, the letdown of milk in the breast, so it's often, women often feel it as like a tension or a pressure or a tingling in their breast that says that the milk is actually gonna start coming out. So, so milk doesn't like squirt out of the nipple from like, it's not like, it's not like a water gun where you like pull a trigger and it squirts out a little hole. Your um, milk ducts are almost more like sweat glands and when the baby sucks, it pulls the milk out of these little sweat glands. There's actually several pores, like eight or nine different pores, that produce milk, and the baby sort of has to suck it out, work it out. Um, the baby suckling also stimulates, oh, it stimulates, so oxytocin helps to trigger that letdown process, actual, you know, release of the milk, but the milk production is fueled by this hormone called prolactin. Prolactin leads to milk production. Oxytocin leads to milk release or milk ejection. And um, oxytocin also is the hormone that's like sort of known as like the bonding hormone or the love hormone. It's supposed to help mother and baby love each other. So breastfeeding moms have dietary requirements. Um, breastfeeding is actually more demanding on the female body than pregnancy is in some ways, in terms of energy anyways. It takes a lot of energy to produce breast milk. Um, so lactating women, it takes about eight, seven to 800 calories a day that your body uses or expends in order to produce breast milk. So um, breastfeeding women are advised to actually continue really their pregnancy diet of getting an extra three to 400 calories a day that way they're still at a small deficit so if they don't get their extra 800 calories a day they only get an extra three or four hundred calories a day that'll leave them in a slight deficit that will allow them to lose their pregnancy weight a little bit faster um, as a nursing mother your carbohydrate needs increase your protein needs increase because you're growing and producing milk um, and your fluid needs increase. Obviously, milk is a fluid, and you're losing. It's kind of like sweating. If you sweat a lot, you need to replace your fluids. If you breastfeed a lot, you need to replace your fluids, hence my bottle of water that I keep sipping out of. Nursing moms also have to keep in mind that a lot of drugs and medications can get into the breast milk, so you really need to limit your intake of alcohol, drugs, caffeine, etc., because they can all get into the breast milk and affect the baby. 
Um, the book poses this question, is breast milk a complete food? Does it offer everything that the, that the infant needs? And it does for the most part, but there's a couple of vitamins we'll talk about um, that are not found very highly in breast milk, and oftentimes you do need to supplement a little bit. So still say, that being said, breast milk is still the most perfect nourishment for infants, and the American Academy of Pediatrics encourages every woman to breastfeed exclusively, meaning only feed the child breast milk, for the first six months of life. And it's even better if you can continue breastfeeding out until one year, though at that after about six months you can start supplementing other, you know, solid foods, etc., but also keep breastfeeding. Um, and they say it's even better, the benefits are even better if you can breastfeed until two years. Some women breastfeed longer than that. Um, in some, some countries or cultures, it's very acceptable to breastfeed for several years. Not so much in America, not as socially acceptable, but is still done um, sometimes. So one of the nutrients that breast milk is fairly low in is vitamin D. And um, especially, like for instance, for Lena, she's a winter baby. She's not going to be getting a lot of sunlight. So vitamin D supplementation um, is often recommended for infants because breast milk doesn't contain a whole lot. Um, another nutrient that's not very high in breast milk is iron which is not that big of a deal in the first few months, but around six months, those all those iron stores that the baby stored away during its time in utero start to become depleted or not enough. They, they need more iron to make more red blood cells, etc. So after about six months, you need to start fortifying the diet with iron, whether it be in the form of solid foods, fortified foods, or whether it be in the form of a supplement. Um, iron supplementation does become necessary around six months. And finally, moms who are on special diets or who have strict diets like vegans um, can become nutrient deficient. So vegans in particular can become deficient in vitamin B12. B12 is found in animal sources in meat and dairy. And so vegans often do not get enough vitamin B12, so they need to make sure that they're eating um, fortified foods that contain B12, like cereals, um, or taking a supplement. And then that B12 will then be passed into the breast milk and passed on to the infant. So a lot of women in the U.S. don't breastfeed, or they start to breastfeed, but they quit too soon before that six-month recommendation that the American Academy of Pediatrics has. So these are some stats um, that show here at birth, about 75% of women are breastfeeding to some extent, at least trying to, maybe doing a little of both, maybe doing a little breastfeeding and a little formula feeding, um, but doing to some extent doing some breastfeeding. So that means 25% either are not interested or are not able to produce milk or... Um, just had other complications that prevented them from being able to breastfeed. But notice that um, at one month, you see that about 25% of the breastfeeding, of women who are breastfeeding, are also supplementing with formula. That's what the dark blue means. The light blue is exclusively breastfed, and the dark blue is breastfed plus some other supplementation like formula. Okay. So only, so less than 50%, one month after, after birth, less than 50% of women are exclusively breastfeeding, which is, remember, the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics, exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Well, let's look at six months. How many women are still exclusively breastfeeding? Um, less than 20%. Less than 20% are exclusively breastfeeding at six, six months out. So definitely not meeting the requirements or the recommendation of the American Academy or American Association of Pediatricians. And you'll see here that as the numbers just steadily decline um, of women stopping breastfeeding or starting to supplement breastfeeding with um, formula. So infant formula is um, it's modified, either modified cow's milk or modified soy protein. 
particularly for infants who are allergic to milk or to the protein in milk. Um, and they're very expensive and they're very heavily fortified. So it's like kind of like a multi taking a multivitamin. Um, there's a lot of minerals and vitamins and essential fatty acids that are added in order to make it more nutri nutritionally adequate. And once upon a time, the first the first few infant formulas that were concocted um, back in the day were really not sufficient. Babies did not do well on infant formula. Now we've really we've really done a good job of composing the right you know composition of nutrients and. Um, Infants who are fed with infant formula still turn out fine, okay? But there's still a lot of things that infant formula lacks. There's no antibodies or other immune factors that get passed on using um, infant formula like you do with breast milk. Also, it's much more expensive. Uh, infant formula cannot change consistency, so there's no... You know, it doesn't start off watery and end off fatty. It's all one consistency. So that's very different than breast milk. Um, so if you have the choice and you choose breast milk, remember, breast is best. Um, but if you can't, your baby will do fine on infant formula. Um, so some, some people think, okay, well, if I can't breastfeed, what if I just feed the baby cow's milk? What if I just use cow's milk instead of human milk? Is that equivalent? And it's not not at all. Cow's milk is very different than breast milk. The composition of cow's milk is very different, both macronutrients and micronutrients. So when it comes to the macronutrients, first of all, there's not enough carbs in milk. In breast milk, there's a lot more carbohydrates. And two, there's a lot more protein in cow's milk than in human milk, which you might think, oh, that's good. Infants need protein. They're growing. But protein is processed by the liver, remember? It can be if you have excess amino acids, then they can go to the liver for processing and for making urine out of. Um, so the liver and the kidneys are very important for processing proteins. Now, in a newborn infant, the liver and kidneys are not fully mature yet, so they can't handle diets that are high in protein. So that's why human breast milk is low in protein compared to cow's milk or goat's milk or other types of milk. So because of this high protein content, the protein in milk is called casein, um, and the immaturity of the baby's digestive system, you are not supposed to feed cow's milk to infants that are under a year old. And there's, I have a list coming up of other foods that you should not ever feed to young infants. So after about four to six months, the baby has matured, the organ systems have matured, the digestive system has matured, and the baby becomes ready to start eating solid foods. They also become hungrier and there's a need to increase their caloric intake, so solid foods is a way to do that. Um, infants are born with this funny reflex called the extrusion reflex, which is a strong reflex to, to use their tongue to push stuff out of their mouth. Um, you get this, you'll see this like if you're trying to comfort a baby with like a pacifier, sometimes they try to push it out with their tongue. Also early stages of feeding solid foods, they often like you put the spoon in their mouth and they sort of spit out half of the food that you just gave them. And it's not really spitting, it's a reflex, their tongue, tongue's reflex to spit things out. So you can't really feed a baby if that reflex is there because they constantly are spitting food out. But around four to six months, that reflex, that ref, reflex starts to disappear. So it allows you to start introducing solid foods. It's important to note that solid food is not a substitute for breast milk. It's a supplement. So at six months, you should start introducing infant food, like rice cereal is a good one to start with. It's fortified, it's plain, and um, it's a good place to start. Infants should have start eating solid foods, but they should not stop breastfeeding. 
should still continue to breastfeed, if possible, out to a year, but at around six months, you also want to be feeding them solid foods in addition to the breast milk. Um, so when it comes to introducing solid foods and weaning your child off breast milk, um, there's a couple of rules. First of all, you want to watch out for allergies when it comes to introducing solid foods. Infants, their aller allergic reactions are slightly different than in older children and adults. Oftentimes they display as diarrhea or vomiting, so it seems like gastrointestinal upset, or they might get red or have some kind of a rash after you introduce them to certain foods. So the tips here are to introduce foods one at a time. So first of all, um, intro when you feed a baby something new, feed them that thing for a couple of days without introducing anything else new into the diet. That way, if they have an allergic reaction, you know what is causing that allergic reaction. So you also want to avoid mixed foods. So like getting a little jar of baby food carrots or baby food apple puree, fine. But you don't want to get some kind of um, puree that's like, um, you know, mixed vegetables, okay? Because then if they have an allergic reaction to that, you don't know which of the vegetables in there, which ingredient caused that allergic reaction. So introducing foods one at a time, not in mixtures, for a period of about two to four days, because that's a good period of time to watch your kid for diarrhea, vomiting, or rash. Um, another thing about introducing solid foods is it's really easy to make your own and so the sort of general advice for doing that is to take foods that you would eat even leftovers for dinner of vegetables or fruits in particular blend them in a food processor or blender or whatever and then you can put them in ice cube trays and freeze them and then you have frozen food that's um, baby food and you can just warm it up and mix it up and it's all pureed and soft and it's just basically what you get in the jars at the store, except much, much cheaper. Um, so homemade baby food is a really good way to go. And it's very nutritious. There's a lot less preservatives. There will be less sodium, more potassium, um, and will be generally more healthy. Some things not to feed an infant. Okay, we already talked about cow's milk being something you don't give an infant that's a year or younger. Because it has high proteins, has too much protein and not enough carbohydrate, it's not the same as breast milk. Also, goat's milk is on that list. Just it's low in nutrients in general. It doesn't meet the requirements. So stick with breast milk or no milk for infants. Some other things you don't want to give them. Any unpasteurized milk or juices unpasteurized means it hasn't gone through a heat round of heating and sterilization and therefore is at a higher risk of infection, some kind of bacterial infection. Um, something else, large quantities of fruit juice. If you give an infant or young child pure fruit juice to drink, like you go out and buy Welch's grape juice, okay, and pour them a large glass, there's a lot of sugar in that fruit juice. And I'm not talking about added sugar. There is a lot of added sugar. But fruit also contain, they contain a bunch of different types of sugar. And one of the types of sugar in fruit is not digestible. And it passes through the digestive system. And it sits in the large intestine. And it attracts water. So water moves into the large intestine. And what happens? You get diarrhea. Um, sometimes you get diarrhea and cramping. So when you feed children juice, you want to make sure that you're diluting it first. Um, other foods not to feed them, anything that's a choking hazard. Hot dogs are the number one food choking hazard for infants, so if you feed them hot dogs, make sure to cut them up into very small pieces that they can't choke on. Uh, you don't want to do this thing, give babies baby cereal and a baby bottle with a big hole cut out of the nipple. So since a lot of babies are comfortable bottle feeding, um, and they have that extrusion reflex when you try to feed them with a spoon and they're always spitting it out. Some parents are tempted to make the feeding process easier by giving them that solid food in a bottle and they just cut the hole in the nipple wider so that the food can pass through. That's not a good way to um, feed a baby. It doesn't teach them how to feed themselves and that's key for them to learn how to start 
you know, picking up food and putting it in their mouth and feeding themselves, um, not through this bottle feeding technique. Uh, you don't want to give them excessive infant formula or human milk. That means that beyond six months, that starting around six months, they really need solid foods. They start needing some of the nutrients that are in those foods. They just need more calories in general. So if you are too reliant on breast milk or infant formula, you can they can become deficient in calories and in nutrients because you're not supplementing the diet with breast or with solid foods. Um, candy, sugar, anything sweetened with extra sugar, um, you want to try to avoid for the sake of their teeth, really. And then lastly is, or firstly on this list, is honey, raw honey, or any honey, really. Um, honey tends to be a natural resource of botulism spores. So if you did your reading of chapter 12, you would have read about botulism. It's a bacteria that can cause a disease, Clostridium botulinum is the name of the bacteria that causes the disease botulism. And infants are most susceptible to it. They're the most susceptible to any type of infection, much more susceptible than adults because they still have a very weak and immature immune system. So honey tends to contain, be a natural source of spores of Clostridium botulinum and infants can become infected. Whereas Adults have stronger immunity if they eat the same honey. Those spores are killed, but not um, in an infant. It can cause serious disease. So avoid feeding honey, just, you know, plain honey, for the first year of life to an infant. Uh, the last issue with feeding infants is baby bottle syndrome or baby bottle caries. Caries is another word for cavities, okay? So what is baby bottle syndrome? It's when you leave a baby in bed with a bottle. So a lot of women who nurse will nurse their babies to sleep. Nursing, feeding, is that suckling process is very comforting for newborns and for infants. And so um, they often fall asleep while doing it or right after doing it. So a lot of parents will just leave their baby when their baby's old enough to sort of hold a bottle and self-feed. That they just leave them with a bottle at night in bed to fall asleep with. And this is very bad because what can happen is the baby can fall asleep like this. The bottle's still in its mouth, constantly sort of leaking that milk in there. And what happens is that milk, the sugar in the milk, just sits there, just sits in their mouth. And their teeth sort of bathe in this sugar that then feeds bacteria in the mouth, good bacteria, that end up like wearing away the enamel of the teeth and eating away at the teeth and giving you cavities. So... It's important not to leave baby in bed with a bottle. So that is infant nutrition. That rounds off infant nutrition. Now we're infants grow into children. Um, and childhood is sort of divided into two periods. From two to five years old is childhood, um, is the preschool period. And then we'll talk about the school age period from six to 11 in a few minutes. So this preschool period um, they're, they're toddlers, essentially, and they are still undergoing considerable growth, but not as rapid as that infancy phase. So growth rate slows, and the appetite is reduced because of that. Um, also, toddlers and you know, these preschool kids, they have, still have very small stomachs. They can't eat large meals, but they do have, um, still have a lot of energy needs that they need to meet. So when it comes to toddlers, making sure that they're eating small portions regularly is important. So some parents don't like to encourage their kids to snack. They want to eat three round meals a day. But for young children, that's not off, that's sometimes not an appropriate feeding schedule because they can't eat that much at meals. It's not always enough to tide them over between meals. So it is okay and recommended that you let small children snack frequently, healthy snacks, um, in order to uh, not overfill their little stomachs and to keep them sort of nourished throughout the day. Toddlers and young children are notorious for their picky eating habits. So trying to foster positive eating behaviors is very important early in childhood because it sets the stage for their eating habits for the rest of their life. Um, 
So some things that really bother kids that they're picky about, they don't like foods that have strong flavors that are very spicy. They don't like foods of certain textures. So if it's something mushy or um, chewy, I don't know, different textures can turn people off of foods, adults and children alike. Also, a lot of kids don't like their foods mixed together or they don't like their foods touching on their plate. And um, that can be enough to dissuade a child to eat is to have their foods be mixed together. Even if they like, you know, even if they like all those, di like peas, peas and carrots, even if they like peas and carrots separately, they might not like peas and carrots mixed together. So trying to respect that um, and separating their foods will improve their eating habits. Um, you also want to avoid bribing or nagging children to eat. That can set up very negative sort of connotations with eating. And you don't really want that psychologically in a child. So what the book recommends is what is called a one-bite policy. This is one I actually use in my family. And the rule is that if there's something on your plate that you don't like or you don't think you're going to like, you just have to take one bite because you never know you might like it. So you just have to try it. Just one bite. And if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. And if you do like it, well then maybe we'll make it again or you can have seconds. So that is um, considered a, a better policy to use rather than bribing children with dessert or nagging them to eat all their plate. My mom, I remember my mom used to pull, anyone, see if anyone else used to have this pulled on them, but, you know, reminding me about the starving children in Africa. You have to finish your plate because there are starving children in Africa who would kill for that plate of food, even if you don't like it. So a lot of guilt tripping, I guess, trying to guilt, don't try to guilt your children into eating. Um, one thing that can really help kids' eating habits or foster their good eating behaviors is to give them choices. Foods lo children love to um, assert their independence and show that they have a choice. So a lot of toddlers go through what I call the no phase, where you ask them anything and the answer is no. So if you say, do you want some green beans? They'll say no. You say, do you want chocolate? They'll say no. They'll say no to anything. Um, so the key there is instead of asking them, do you want this, is to give them a choice between two things. And you can set it up so that whatever they choose is healthy. So instead of saying, you know, do you want green beans or chocolate? You say, do you want green beans or broccoli? You know, you give them some healthy options to choose from. Then it makes them feel empowered that they have a choice, that they're controlling their food selection. But you're actually the one in power because you are controlling which what their, what their options to choose from are. So um, giving children a choice often makes them eat better because they feel like they chose that and they had took part in the decision-making process around their food. Another way to trick kids into eating healthy food is to prepare it in fun ways. So um, my dad used to do this when I was, when I was little. He used to, one of, one of my sisters and my favorite desserts after dinner was orange slushies. We thought slushies are like things you get at the movie theater or the gab. They're like special occasion things during the summer. And my dad one night was like, who wants an orange slushie? And we're like, oh, I do, I do. And essentially he just took ice and orange juice and blended it together, which is an actually very healthy snack. But here we are thinking we're getting these slushies. You know, it was fun. It was more fun to drink orange juice as a slushie than to just drink orange juice that we actually considered it dessert. You can also make fruit popsicles, you get a blender, blend a whole bunch of frozen fruit and some milk or some juice and um, freeze it in a popsicle with a popsicle stick in it and make real fruit popsicles. Also you can make faces and designs with uh, food on their plate which makes it more fun for them to eat as well. Uh, and lastly and not least is to model nutritious behavior. If your kids see you eating healthy, they're going to be more likely to eat healthy. Um, some common food-related concerns with children are iron deficiency. Again, um, kids need iron as they're growing to produce more red blood cells. 
um, dental caries or cavities from eating too much sugar. So um, you want to really try to limit sugar consumption for children and make sure that they're brushing their teeth with a fluoride toothpaste or taking a fluoride supplement or drinking fluoridated water. Um, allergies you still want to be on the lookout for during toddlerhood. You're introducing new foods now so there's more foods that they could potentially be allergic to. So again, you want to introduce new foods one at a time for a couple of days before introducing the next new food. That way you can look out for those signs of allergy. And lastly, obesity is an issue with children these days. Obesity is on the rise nationally, but it's also on the rise in not just adults, but in children and adolescents, etc. So some risk factors for obesity amongst children are a high birth weight, um, a family history of obesity. If your parents are obese, you're more likely to be obese. Sedentary lifestyle, so playing a lot of video games, not getting out enough. Consuming energy-dense foods and beverages. So if you give your, your kids juices, a lot of juice or soda, and not a lot of milk or water, they're more likely to become obese. So the second part of childhood, the later part of childhood, is children who are 6 to 11 years old. And these children often are not eating nutritionally adequate diets. Um, they're eating more at school a lot of times, and school lunches may, the school lunches are supposed to follow federal recommendations, nutrition recommendations, but the students don't necessarily. So a student might have a tray with a pizza pizza, and some salad and some beans and you know some fruit but maybe they only eat the pizza they might not eat any of the healthier stuff on the plate they may not make healthy choices on their own Oft also kids tend to skip breakfast um, they eat more fried foods and sweetened beverages like sodas and juices so all of these things contribute to um, some of these nutrition related health concerns of childhood um, obesity being the major one. So obesity, again, on the rise in children of all ages. Here's a graph showing you in the 70s, early 70s, about 4% of kids were obese. As of right now, about 20% of children, 20% are fall in the obese category. Okay, so there's a lot of causes of obesity, a lot of different contributing factors that we've talked about. Um, diet, genetics, sedentary lifestyle all play a role. And Michelle Obama recently, well, in the last couple of years, started a program to promote the health of Americans called Let's Move. And it's all about getting that hour of activity a day, that hour of physical activity that children need in order to burn calories and set up, you know, physically active lifestyle. After the in, childhood ends at adolescence, at puberty. So puberty signals the end of childhood. It's when the body starts undergoing hormonal changes that transition into adulthood. So boys begin puberty around the age of 10 to 12 years old. It's when it begins. And girls can begin puberty around as early as 8 years old, so between 8 and 10 years old. So the body starts changing. They start having you know, developmental changes. Um, and some point during puberty, you experience a large growth spurt. Um, the growth spurt increases your height, your weight, your muscle mass, etc. And in boys, it comes a little bit later than in girls. So girls usually have their growth spurt between the ages of 10 and 13. It's also when they begin menstruating, having their period. And boys usually are a little bit later. Their growth spurt occurs between the ages of 12 and 15 um, when they shoot up in height. So um, adolescents face different nutritional concerns because, largely because of peer pressure and how they, so they, adolescents are, they're becoming adults. They're becoming more independent, making more independent food choices and meal choices. And the health of those choices can be influenced by a lot of things, by their family life, by what they've been eating growing up. So modeling healthy eating behavior at home and encouraging healthy eating will help them to make healthy choices once they're making their own choices like in adolescence. 
Sadly, though, there's a lot of peer pressure that goes on in adolescence, and that can negatively influence food choices and lifestyle choices. So um, increasing sedentariness, I just made that word up, and um, eating a lot of fast food, etc., are common practices in adolescence. So here's a graph, again, showing you the percentage of obese teenagers in the 70s to now, and now the number is about 18%. About 18% of teenagers are considered obese, the BMI of higher than whatever it is for that age group. So um, some concerns, dietary concerns for adolescents, obesity, just like in childhood, um, the rates of obesity are, are increasing. And obesity, of course, Obesity during childhood and adolescence increases your risk for obesity in adulthood. It increases your risk for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and atherosclerosis, not just later in life. But teenagers who are obese can be hypertensive. They can develop type 2 diabetes. And they actually can start developing atherosclerosis, that fatty plaque deposits in their arteries near their heart. So um, that's a real concern for overweight teens. Also, iron and calcium are two very important minerals that are you have increased needs for during adolescence and that adolescents typically become deficient in because of their eating habits. So iron deficiency is common in females um, because a lot of teenage females don't eat enough, period, or they um, become vegetarians a lot of times as a way to mask disordered eating. So they don't eat enough, mi enough meat and get enough heme iron. Also, they start menstruating. They start losing blood every month, which reduces their iron stores. So making sure that um, teenagers get enough iron is really important. Calcium is also important. It's important for bone growth and establishing bone density, which really occurs in your teenage years. You do undergo a lot of skeletal growth during adolescence, and that growth sort of sets the stage for what your bone density is going to be well into adulthood. So getting enough calcium and vitamin D during adolescence is important for your bone density for the rest of your life. And then lastly, during adolescence is when you really want to keep an eye out for eating disorders. A lot of eating disorders um, originate or occur during adolescence. So it's something to keep your eye out for. So then after adolescence, you become an adult and you follow the nutrition information that's in the rest of the book. But at the end of adulthood, you have um, older adulthood. You become an older adult, and your, your body starts to decline um, in functioning, and so your nutrient needs change. So um, in the U.S. now, our life expectancy has really increased in the last century, and um, we went from having a life expectancy of about 47 years to having a life expectancy of about 78 and a half years uh, on average. So... That's a long time that we can live for, and that's a long time for us to be in this older age population and needing these different uh, nutrient, having different nutrient needs. So understanding the nutrient needs of aging Americans is important because we're actually getting more, we're, as a society, we're getting older and older. Medical advances have helped us to live longer and fight chronic diseases that took our lives earlier, um, but yet we haven't improved our health. So we're living longer, but we're not living healthier. We're living longer with disease, essentially. We've, medicine has helped us to prolong our lives by um, sort of dampening this, the symptoms of disease, but we haven't done away with chronic diseases, and we're not actually living healthier. We're just living longer. So this is, you, this is a, a, a chart showing the increase in number of people who are 65 or older, and the number of people who are 85 and older in the U.S. And then this, these last um, few bars here, these last couple of spots, are showing you the projected um, numbers that we're actually expecting an increase in um, the older populations of people in the U.S. in years to come. So trying to make them healthier would, should be the next goal. It's not just to live longer, but to live healthier. So older adulthood is defined as 65 years of age or more. And um, 
as you reach older adulthood, you start aging. And what is aging? Aging is essentially the deterioration of your cells. And most biologists who study aging um, point to the DNA as the source of, of aging and the source of this damage. So if DNA becomes damaged, it, it means that your cells can't function properly. And so then they become damaged and they either die or they just don't function properly. So um, the people who study this kind of stuff, we call them biogerontologists. Okay, biogerontology is the study of the biology of aging. And again, a lot of it is pointed at DNA damage, something damaging the DNA, whether it's time, wear and tear, uh, or whether it's free radicals that damage the DNA, um, or other things. Uh, over time, accumulating DNA damage causes cellular damage and then therefore decline of your tissues and your organ systems and the way they function. So some common re nutrition-related concerns in older adult populations are changes in their body weight for a lot of reasons. As you get older, your muscle mass just starts to decline. Part of that is due to reduced physical activity just because you're getting old and things start to hurt. Um, so muscle mass declines from lack of use, but also just as part of the aging process. When your muscle mass declines, your BMR, your basal metabolic rate, also declines. So you're not burning as many calories. If you're not burning as many calories, you don't need to eat as many calories. Your energy needs to decline. So if you're not eating as many calories, you're also going to lose weight. So changes in body weight definitely occur as you get older. Um, and if you continue to eat the same amount of food that you did when you were younger, you do start to gain weight because your, your energy needs have declined, but you're getting the same amount in. Um, nutrient deficiency is also a very real problem for older adults for a lot of reasons. A lot of older adults have reduced appetite or food intakes because they lose their ability to taste and smell food, so they're not that hungry. They have difficulty um, swallowing Sometimes they don't have teeth to chew with, so a lot of times they don't eat as much as they should or as much as they used to, and that can lead to a nutrient deficiency. Other reasons that they have nutrient deficiency are because of reduced absorption of nutrients due to reduced digestion, reduced digestive function. So you start producing less saliva, less stomach acid, less intrinsic factor. What does intrinsic factor help you? Um, what nutrient does intrinsic factor help you absorb? Vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 cannot be absorbed without intrinsic factor, okay? So if you're not producing enough intrinsic factor, old, older adults are particularly prone to becoming deficient in vitamin B12. Um, so lifespan is the amount of times that we talked about what the life expectancy was, your lifespan is how long you can live for. And the oldest living person on the books is this woman, Jean Calmont. She was a French lady. She lived 122 years. She was 122 and 164 days old, which is the longest lifespan ever recorded by far. I think the next person, I don't think the next, I'm not sure anyone else has ever broken 120. But the next person might be 120. She's 122. So that's pretty huge. That's a pretty long time to live. So how do you know how do you know how long you're gonna live? Well, I mean a lot of it's luck and chance and not getting hit by a car or um, having cancer, okay? But um, and so a lot of it is genetics. If you had a lot of older family members who lived into their nineties or one hundreds, you're gonna be more likely to live that long. Um, but it's not just influenced by genetics, it's also influenced by environment, namely your diet and lifestyle. And one very interesting um, source of research in terms of lifespan is this caloric restriction. Okay, so this was first discovered in, I think, worms in C. elegans in a lab. But anyway, um, it's been done on a lot of different animals. So. This should have a comma. I keep forgetting to change that. Rats, mice, fish, and flies, and worms, all these different animals. I think it's actually being done in chimps and primates now. And 
having some variable results. But essentially, the studies show that if you put these animals on a calorie-restricted diet, so in other words, a low-calorie diet, it significantly increases their lifespan and it reduces a lot of physiological factors that are associated with chronic diseases. So these animals have decreased insulin levels, they have decreased oxidative stress or free radicals, they have decreased fat mass and increased their lean muscle mass, and they have decreased rates of cancer. All of these things just by restricting the amounts of calories that they eat every day. So it doesn't matter the source of the calories. If they're eating low-calorie diets and their diet is adequate in um, the micronutrients that they need, they actually live longer. So, like I said, there's some studies going on in primates right now to see if this would translate into humans. Um, the mechanism of this is not really clear. What scientists think is going on, their theory is that reduced calorie intake means reduced metabolism. And one of the sort of side effects of metabolism is production of free radicals. You use oxygen that you breathe in order to respirate, in order to metabolize things and make ATP. So the theory is that if you are on a calorie-restricted diet, it slows your metabolism and a slower metabolism means fewer free radicals, and fewer free radicals means less DNA damage, and less DNA damage means less aging, okay? So it's really very interesting stuff, what's coming out, and they haven't done human trials yet. I mean, they've done maybe one or two small human studies, but um, another interesting human study that lends some credibility to this is that the oldest uh, population, so the population of people that live the longest, that have the longest lifespan um, or life expectancy is people in, I think, Okinawa, Japan, or some island near Okinawa, Japan. They have the longest lifespan. And what is unique about them is that they sort of follow a calorie-restricted diet. They eat a lot of low-calorie, nutrient-dense foods. And their sort of policy that they grow up with is eat until you're 80% full. Unlike in the U.S. where the policy is eat until your plate is clean, you know, which is oftentimes eat until you're over full. But in this Okinawa, they, the um, sort of motto that they follow is eat until you're 80% full and then stop. So they eat these sort of lower calorie diets, these calorie restricted diets, and they happen to have the longest lifespan, the lowest rate of cancer, mm a lot of health benefits. So it does suggest that caloric restriction might work in humans. What's the magic number of calories? That's unclear. Some of the studies use, use diets that are about 900 calories a day, which is very restrictive. So the number of calories that you would want to restrict yourself to is very unclear. But there can actually be some benefits to a low calorie diet. And I'm not talking about starving yourself, but just getting just the right amount of food and not getting any excess. The key though to a diet like this is that you have to make sure that you're eating nutrient dense foods because if you're not eating a lot of food you need to make sure that you're getting all of your nutrient needs, your macronutrients and your micronutrients. So you want to really focus on nutrient dense foods if you do a diet something like this. So this caloric restriction stuff is in that highlight section at the end of the chapter. So you do want to um, read that section a bit. And otherwise, that is the end, the end of the last lecture on the last chapter in this book. And um, your test is going to be on chapters 10, 11, and 13, and as are your last diet analysis assignment. So hopefully you're working on that. The last one is a little more flexible, a little easier, less factual information than vitamins and minerals. And um, I hope that you got something out of this, especially if you are in one of these life stages, pregnant, nursing, or an older adult. Um, or if you have children, you can also use some of this information. So um, hopefully that uh, was not too boring. And um, hopefully I will see you before the end of the semester, but 
I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find child care for Lena and make it to the final exam, but so this might be the last time you see me this semester. Um, thanks for watching. Bye.